Good morning. Good to see you, church family. How we doing? Doing good? Me too. I want to talk about the mission heart of God for a few minutes today, and um, I want to demystify it a little bit, because a lot of times when you hear missions, a lot of times it's presented in very, very lofty, lofty terms, you know. Uh, the old days it would be there would be a couple that felt an unction to go to a country, uh, the church would rally around them. They would put their faces and their pictures up on a, a little flannel graph map on the wall and, you know, draw little yarn lines to them and post their budget and their needs and all that. And so, so that kind of communication would lead people to believe that there are certain people called to do missions or be missional in this world. And so um, that's not the case because you and I are missionaries. Man, you seem a little hesitant there, a little reluctant, a little kind of a little grumbly, a little... It's, it's true. Uh, missions is what the whole Bible is all about. It's the whole thing. From Genesis to Revelation, it, one word inserted there, it's missions. And we get to participate with Jesus in his great commission. Everybody say great commission. And it's, and it's a great... So it, here, here it is. It's so simple. It's taken me so long to figure out how simple it really is. And it goes like this. Jesus' first words to every single person in this room was follow me. His first words. First words you ever responded to was follow me. Everybody he calls, he says follow me. When you say, okay, what am I getting myself into? He doesn't really tell you. But you, you know, he kind of baits you along and you follow and you realize as you're following him, you're leaving a life that you once knew. And it wasn't a good life. Compared to life in the kingdom of God and the new creation that we are in Christ, your old life and my old life was garbage. I don't care how much money you had. I could care less. I've, I've talked to people with tons of money that were absolutely miserable. People who were successful businessmen on their fourth marriage. Had worldly success. Lived where they wanted. Vacationed where they wanted. Drove the cars what they wanted. Flew the planes they wanted. Had everything, but were miserable. And then Jesus comes along and says, follow me. And you follow him out of your old life. He give, you follow him, he gives you a new purpose. Part of it is what you're hearing here today. You're hearing about sacrifice. You're hearing about giving. You're being stretched. Make no mistake, following Jesus is an incredibly stretching experience. Because you and I have this little tendency that when we follow Jesus, we usually start out, you know, either reluctantly or, yeah, okay, I'm in, let's go. And then you take a few steps and then you realize, you know, he tells you to do some things that are really not comfortable and convenient. You know, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not like a Hallmark card where you go, oh, that's good, that's touching, that's good. No, he throws these little zingers in at you. You know, love your enemies. And you're like, oh, okay, wait a minute, let's back up just for a moment here. And forgive everybody. And give generously. And lay your life down. And it's like, and at some point, and I've done it many times, I followed, and then I followed a little slower. And then when he wasn't looking, I kind of did this a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little backpedal there, you know? And then, and then you find out that's all empty too. That's right, that's what I came from. A visionless, purposeless, no meaning, empty, self-indulgent, hedonistic life. That was garbage. And so he says, follow me. We follow him. We follow him out of this old life. And he never tells you quite where he's going. And that's where trust comes in. And that's where faith comes in. But wherever he's leading, it's always good. And it's always hard and difficult. And it costs you some or all of your life also, which is real living, by the way. And, and, you know, it's funny because people, I, I think about, once I go back to the simplicity that's in Christ, the simplicity of mission, you know, people say, how do you know where to go? How do you know what countries you need to go to? You know, it's like, never have to make a decision. 
I never have to guess. There is no guesswork ever. I do, and we do as a church, what the Apostle Paul said. He said, there was great and effectual doors that were opened for us. So what's a mission of life? You just walk through the doors that he opens. Now, I didn't know the doors were called Haiti and Pakistan and Iraq. I mean, there are, you know, kinder, gentler countries out there. You know, every time I, I look at our, our government website and it says, you know, level four, red, do not travel, all this kind of thing. Like, oh, there's got to be a little easier places to go. But that's where the doors open. And when the doors open, that's where you walk. And if you don't, it's disobedient and then you're miserable. So it's like, I'll choose obedience, even if it's hard, because I know there'll be a blessing and his peace and presence in the midst of it. So here's a door that opened. We'll tell you a little more about it in a few minutes, but have some friends and uh, they happen to be in um, Albania and Macedonia and Kosovo. And they called me up and they said, hey, there's a, there's a pastor we want you to meet. And we told him about you and we think you guys would be, you know, good fit. And he's the head of the evangelical church of Albania. And so, oh, great. So they connected me with him. We had a Zoom call, great conversation. So tomorrow, Gunnar and I leave, and we go to Albania. And one of the things we're going to do is meet, meet this guy, the head of the, all the evangelical churches there, and, he, and just talking to him. He said, you know, our pastors are, you know, kind of discouraged. Um, it's really hard here. There's mosques everywhere. It's a Muslim nation. Um, they need mentoring. They need, so boom, that's the door. Don't have to make anything happen. There's the door. And then we'll go to Kosovo. And uh, there's a thousand refugees from Afghanistan, and it's winter. It's just coming on right now, and they need, they need a thousand coats. I'm in. Sign me up. I'm in. We're going. Made a few calls, got a bunch of money, going to go over there and, and, and buy coats. Kosovo coats. Coats for Kosovo. And then there's one other little caveat they threw in. And once again, this is, you don't have to make things happen, but you do have to have your eyes open. They said, oh, bring a suit. I said, bring a suit. I got delivered from suits. I hate suits. I despise suits. I despise ties, you know, creases. I hate them. I hate all that stuff. They said, no, we think we're going to be able to meet with the president of Albania. I'll bring a suit. <laughs> I will bring a suit for that one. So need your prayers for that. So Jesus' first words are follow me. Jesus' last words are what? Go into all the world and do what? Make disciples of all nations, all ethnic groups. Make it. Literally, the language is written in very forceful, very strong, repetitive. Make it happen. That's what Jesus is saying. Make it happen. Make this happen. So we make, we make disciples. What, what goes along with that? He says, baptize them. What is bapti baptism? How many of you have been baptized in here? Okay. Baptism isn't just this little thing where you bring this silly little hot tub, fill it up, dunk people, clap, clap. No, 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 no. When you are baptized, you and I are immersed into the life in the kingdom of God. We are baptized out of an old life of sin and despair, flesh, all that stuff. I mean, it's a big deal. And he says baptize them. In many countries, when you get baptized and, and your family's not on board and they're a different religion, you're done. You lose your family. And when I say lose your family, I mean you lose your family. It's not like, oh, we'll get together once in a while. No, they don't want to talk to you. They cut you off because you shamed the family. Make disciples. And then this one. Just ponder this this week. Teach them to obey all my commands. Do you know how many commands Jesus issued? Nobody knows. We never, we never talk about that. A lot of times we'll, we'll go into grace. We're saved by grace. All true, 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 true. But there are commands that Jesus said. Divine emphatics, non-negotiables. You can find 50 in the Gospels. Look for them. Absolutely. 50 commands. That's obedience. Well, why is that so significant? Because if you and I aren't taught to obey the commands of Jesus, the Scripture... What we will do, we will create a more convenient gospel for us. How do you know that? Just scroll through social media. And you will see people making up their own version of Christianity that is absolutely void of biblical truth. And basically it's, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. 
Because Jesus understands. I'll tell you, he does not understand that. People make up, make up their own rules. I can do this. I can you know, get into all kinds of craziness and debauchery. And it's like, no, you know, that's how old puritanical and blah, 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 blah. No, man. The commands are life to those who find them, to those who seek them, and to those who live them. And everything else is just a cheap counterfeit. And so Jesus said, when you, go, when, you, when you go and you represent me and you introduce people to me and they follow me, let them know what's at stake. And it's your life and it's your obedience. And you don't, you know, there's a God you and I want and there's a God who is. They're not the same God. Make no mistake about it. You and I want to create God in our image, in our likeness, that's very convenient for us. You can't escape sacrifice, discomfort, heartache, sorrow. You, you just can't. So anyways, that's just a couple thoughts on missions right there. <laughs> Baptize, teach them. But then here's the caveat. This is the great. After, after that, after you do the discipleship stuff, he says, I am with you always. Are you kidding me? Couldn't trade in the presence of Jesus for anything. But when does he say, I'm with you always? I mean, that's just true. You know, when we have the Holy Spirit, he never leaves or forsakes us. But when we're walking in obedience, man, I, he is right there with you. I never feel alone when I go to another country. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how brutal it is. I don't care how much despair, sickness, disease, poverty, unanswered questions. I don't care. I never feel alone. Part of that is because I do have a great prayer team, and they pray, and I give updates but I feel the presence of Jesus even in the midst of absolute insanity. It's a great life. It's a good life. Follow me. Go into all the world. The Gospels are how to live in between those two points. What's the, God's mission? Cover to cover. Create, rescue, deliver, redeem, save, restore, heal, align, and implement his kingdom. When Jesus said, I must be about my father's business, that's what he was talking about. When we're about his business, that's what we're talking about. What do you do when you go to another country? We bring Jesus, he comes with us, he creates, he rescues, he delivers, he sets free, he heals, he aligns people. It's, it's phenomenal. Now, I just want to see this verse right here. Jesus has risen from the dead. Mary, Martha, they go to the tomb. Tomb's empty. They're freaking out. They talk to an angel. They go running back. They tell Peter. Peter runs to the tomb. They get there. Oh my gosh, mind-blowing. They go running back. People are scared. They're afraid of the Jews. Here's what happens. On the evening, the first day of the week, disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, that's not what Jesus called them to do. <laughs> no, no. He said, go preach. Go give your life away. Go love. Go give compassion. He didn't say, find a small room with good locks, hold out, hide out, shake in your boots, and wait for the end. He didn't, he didn't say that. So they're actually living contrary to what Jesus tells them to do. Now, this gives me a lot of hope because I know me. And I have a time or two in the last 39 years of following Jesus. Not always walked the way he wanted me to walk. So what's his response to that? Okay, I love it. And this is for you too. If you're out of sorts, you're, you, you're straddling the fence, you got one, one foot in, one foot out, you know, I don't know if I want to follow Jesus. You know, what, what is his response? His response to you is the same response as he had with them. The doors are locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Wow. You're looking at the compassion of God right there. Jesus didn't need to show up for this. He already told them what to do, remember? He, he already said, he already said, he gave them all the instructions they would ever need, but their humanity got the best of them. And so what is Jesus' response? You, I should have picked 12 others. You lame, you so lame. You're hiding, you're shaking here, you followed me. You, did you see me shaking? No. No, he doesn't do that, he doesn't chastise them. He comes with peace. How does he confront sin? Forcefully, but with peace. And he says, peace be with you. It's literally saying, I'm taking authority over your anxiety and I'm gonna give you tranquility 
and I'm going to give you joy and wholeness, like right here and right now. Peace always has joy connected to it. It's not just this, ooh, I feel, ooh, peace. No, peace has this, yeah, calm and a smile. It's good. So these guys, and watch the, the turn of events. And after he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples were what? Overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Yeah, you know, so when you demystify missions, just think about this for a minute. What does Jesus do? What's his heart for the world? It's to step into the midst of all chaos. That's what he does. That's, that's how when we sinned, God enacted his gospel redemption plan of sending Jesus. Jesus has never been intimidated by a mess on the planet, including yours. I mean, just see law, that one. Pause. And I love that. He's not intimidated. He's not reluctant. He comes full blown in, right in the midst of their little shaky, quaky knees. Says, peace be with you. Authority. So missions, here's just a couple of things here. It's standing in the midst of other people's brokenness, whatever that looks like, as a representative of Jesus. Here's a picture right here. And this is, this is just a visual, okay? Short version, uh, August 14th, massive earthquake in Haiti. We're there. We're going house to house, ministering to people, rubble, you know, stitching people up. I mean, there's all kinds of craziness going on. It's heavy. It's violent. It's disorienting. Um, people are dying. We get a call. This guy in the orange's son is buried under that slide. And can we dig him out? And so, you know, Steve bears with me. He knows how to run that stuff. That's him. He's digging it out. And I'm thinking, this guy, and on the side, there's about 150 Haitians. It just comes, just comes like a sea of people. And there's this guy in the orange. That's the dad, and he's standing alone. So what is missions? Missions is coming alongside that guy that you don't know that is in absolute heartache and heartbreak and putting your arm around him and holding him, and that's not really their culture. And so for me, it was like, man, if that was me and I'm waiting for them to get my son's body, I can't, can't even wrap your brain around it. There's no script for it. So then they, they would get the guy out, they drag him up, and then everybody comes around, and everybody's clicking pictures of his dead son. And I'm, I'm holding the dad, and I'm crying with the dad, and it is awkward. It is uncomfortable. And so I prayed. I preached a little bit on the love of God and how you're all going to die. I mean, positive encouraging, man, I'm telling you. You're all going to die. Anyways, your life will never be any anything without God, without letting Jesus save you. And he'll, I mean, so you got 150 people standing around in a dead body and a grieving dad. And that's what missions is. Not all the time, but the point is you come into a world, you come into somebody else's world and you're there full time, fully present, giving whatever you have and it's prayers and tears. And that's all I had. That's what you do. Um, and it's important you get this. Jesus stood in the midst. Jesus still stands in the midst because he's resurrected. He's alive. I don't know how many people really kind of grasp that, but he really is alive. No, he's alive like right now. That's just not some little thing. He's alive again. No, he, he, like, he really is. He really is. So I talked to a guy two days ago, and he's from Kosovo, and he was a Muslim guy. And a Christian gave him a Bible and said, you need to read this. And the guy just polite, like, oh, okay. But the guy secretly hated Christians. And it had a lot to do with wars and all that kind of stuff. Don't have time to go into it. But he gives him a Bible. He doesn't read it. Guy follows up with him, I don't know, a few weeks later. Hey, did you read the Bible? The guy said, oh, man. He said, I better go. He goes, so I just went and I just read one thing. And I said, oh, yeah, Hezekiah. You know, didn't, didn't read it. But then he started getting really agitated. And he said, God, I need to know. So he took his Quran, he took, took this Bible, and for six months he read. And he read, and he finally said, Jesus, if you are real, you have to show me. I mean, really show me. 
that night he had a dream. <laughs> and he's telling me this. It's absolutely fascinating. He says, Jesus just comes walking right up to me in the dream, and he said, I won't say his name, will you help me build a bridge between Christians and Muslims? I don't know what you dream about. <laughs> Jesus shows up in your dream. It's settled. The issue is settled. He became a Christian. His life's been threatened. Got beat up by ISIS. Kosovo is the number one place of recruiting terrorists right now on the planet. And this guy has been leading imams to Christ. That's missions. That's missions. So... You know, it, it's, it's about compassion. Jesus, every time it says Jesus was moved with compassion, he healed people. And, here, and here's the thing. People think that you have to get an unction. I have to have this feeling. I have to have this, this thing before I go do something. But it doesn't work that way. Because if we follow Jesus' steps, here's how Jesus did it. It said Jesus went. Second. He saw the people, and he saw that they were helpless, and they were broken, and they were w without a shepherd. And then it says he healed them. In between those two things, <laughs> he was moved with compassion, and he healed them. And what is compassion? Once again, we live in an age where we don't want to feel. We want to numb. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to ache. We don't want to shed tears, man. We want to keep scrolling and find some little fascinating thing to kind of occupy our attention. What is compassion? Is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside of somebody else's skin. It is the knowledge that they can never really be, have any peace and joy. There can never be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you. And I will just tell you this, any country that I've ever been to, I never had the feeling to go there. I never had the, oh, I have this burden to go to Pakistan. Oh, my heart just aches for Haiti. No, I just go. You just go. Now, when you get there, then you get wrecked. Then you get wrecked. Then you have feelings. But what we do is we wait for the feeling. Don't wait for the feeling. Just go. Reach out. Go beyond yourself. And then as you do that, and then and when you give, too, when you give to missions, where your treasure is, there your heart is also, your heart changes. But it's always obedience first. Always obedience first. Okay, that's good. Now, I want Gunnar to come on up here. And uh, him and I have been, like, hanging out a few places around the world. And we leave tomorrow. Um, but I just want to share this one thing right here. John Maxwell, you know, big leadership guru. And uh, whether you like him or not, he's written more books on leadership than anybody in history. He gets invited to the United Nations to do a two-hour talk to all the ambassadors from every country. <laughs> That'd be a little intense, wouldn't it? Man, what am I going to preach there? <laughs> so so he, he prays, he ponders, he gets up, he has two hours, he addresses all these ambassadors from the, the whole world, and here's what he says to them. And this is a question that you, you're always asking, what I'm asking. Anybody that goes to a church, anybody that goes anywhere, any country we go to, this is what they're asking. If they're not asking it verbally, they're asking it internally. And here's the three questions. Do you care about me? That's what every person, they, that's what, number one, do you care about me? The second question is, can you help me? In other words, do you have any resources of any kind that will help me. And then the third question is, can I trust you? Are you safe? That's what everybody's asking around the world, everywhere we go. They don't even know, but they're asking those questions. So Gunnar, I love this evolution that's happened in your life and here in your journey. So why don't you just share what's going on? Um, yeah. Hello. I told Bob, I was like, just have me up there so people don't have to clap. That would be great. He's like, all right, almost made it. Um, you know, this could go many different ways. We'll see what the Holy Spirit uh, has to say. Um, you know, Hebrews 12, 2 says that we're to keep our eyes 
on Jesus as we run this race. And just as I was um, jotting down some notes, that's just the top of the page is Jesus, because that's, that's the point. You know, mission without Jesus is, is, just, is just meaningless. There's, there's no fruit. You know, I watched plenty of travel vlogs on YouTube, and it, what's the point? I mean, there's just no point, you know, putting happy music on while you're going to Iraq. And I'm like, that's, that's not the same perspective I have, you know, when I go there. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just super honored by this, this body. I'm humbled to be up here and uh, to call all of you family. And it's just incredible to see what the Lord has done in my life uh, over the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think I was very jaded, you know, living in, in China full time. Uh, it's just easy to feel so disconnected from the whole of the church. And it's so easy to feel like no one cares uh, about what we're giving our life to. And, uh, you know, sadly, like when, when we would come back and people would ask, you know, oh, how's it going? Um, you just learned that, oh, it's just a polite question. You know, they don't actually care. And so you just learn the, the five-second response. Oh, it's going really well. Awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, on, on the hard months, I remember one month, uh, $400 came in. I was like, uh, my wife and I just couldn't comprehend. Like, that, that was it. That was our month's budget. It was $400. And um, it's just those moments. I'm like, man, Lord, does... does what is this? Like, why, why are we giving our life to this? You know? Um, and like Bob said, it's, it's costly. It's costly to follow Jesus. It's costly to do mission. And, uh, you know, I was looking on Instagram, just, I typed in missions and, uh, hated it. I was the worst. It was just, because I think so often what we, we celebrate in missions is the success, right? You know, you gather the kids and, you know, selfie, and it's like, yay, a mission trip, and uh, you miss the cost. You miss the, the miracles of, of being willing to die to self and obey the call and go, and, and for the finances to come in, and for the, you know, 40 plus hours of travel, and the jet lag, and you miss the, the, the sickness, and the, the physical ailments that come with it, the spiritual warfare, the, I mean, just none of that gets shared, you know, and, um, and that's following Jesus. I mean, that's not just missions. We all know that. None of us come in here just like gushing about all the horrible things that we've had to confront in the last week, month, year, in our whole life. Um, I don't know. For me, I tend, I tend to forget the bad. I think that's why I'm able to keep going. I uh, just, you know, horrible trip. And then the next day, the day after I get back, it's all good. I'm like, all right, I'll go again. And I, I've just learned it's because we serve a God that is merciful and gracious and kind, and he uses all things for good. And, uh, you know, my, my desire for this, this body is for us to be all in. And um, I, watched, I watched a video uh, from David Platt, and I was just really stirred because he, David Platt is so for the unreached, and that's my heart. My heart is for the unreached. My heart beats for the unreached. Um, the two, the two billion people. <laughs> that, that have never had the opportunity to hear Jesus. And, you know, my favorite moments in life are meeting someone and asking them, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they have no idea what I'm talking about because I get to bring that good news. But what I loved about this video was that David Platt just painted the picture of the whole world, America included. It wasn't just 
focusing on the unreached as this is the most important thing in the world, even though that's that's what I believe. But um, you know, to just summarize, I'll kind of do my my own synopsis of of my perspective of it. But to see the nation of Tigray, the people of Tigray in northern Ethiopia, be absolutely massacred and experience horrific sexual trauma, to see the, the believers in North Korea suffer more than any other nation in the world, to see the nation of Afghanistan on the brink of utter collapse and starvation, to see the turmoil in Haiti, to see the hunger in the United States, and I mean, there's hungry people everywhere, to see the poor, the billions of poor people that live on less than $2 a day, the Christless, you know, those who are called here know that there are people here who do not know Jesus. They have not tasted and seen that he is good. The two billion unreached people that don't know a Christian who do not live within reach of any church or, or body of Christ, the people in China and Laos and Myanmar who are suffering at the hands of brutal regimes, the Christians in Lebanon who are contemplating fleeing because of the collapse of their, their government, those who are be, being beheaded and murdered in Burkina Faso, the, the needs are endless in this world. And it can be exhausting hearing it over and over and over. But the question that, that David Platt poses is, are we going to die in our religion or are we going to die in our devotion? And it's, it's costly to obey the commands of Jesus. And has anyone ever heard the term donor fatigue? It's when... I was reading an article from the UN, uh, all the, you know, the least known humanitarian crisis in the world. And uh, donor fatigue is a big issue because all these NGOs are trying to raise money for these causes, but uh, donors get weary of the constant need because it's insatiable, it's never ending. And I thought about that. And uh, you know, even as we, we talk about finances here um, as a church family, and we talk about giving for, for missions, I just realized donor fatigue is just not biblical. <laughs> because donor fatigue implies that you yourself are the one meeting the needs, that you yourself are the one that has a limited finite supply. But you know, as I've read a book uh, about George Mueller, has anyone, heard. And we all know, for the most part, that George Mueller cared for orphans and that he prayed. He prayed in, I think in today's currency, it'd be about over $15 million uh, just through prayer, just through prayer. And um, that just shows that our God is not limited in any way, shape, or form. And so if it's okay to talk about money, um, You know, you really just got to ask yourself, do I take ownership of this or am I simply a steward of your finances? Whatever resources you have, the coat on your back, the home that you live in, is it yours or is it his? And does he have exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever imagine? Because that's the question. And so, you know, missions is costly. And I, I've learned... Uh, over the years, as I started doing missions to Asia in 2009, um, how incredibly inefficient it is. You know, I've got my own ideas of how God could tweak things a bit to make things a little bit better. And uh, I just, I found that he's not super concerned with that. Um, and, you know, and once, why, why should he be? He doesn't think like we think. All right, God, I've got thousand dollars I can put toward mission. Okay, that's what you can work with. You know, I heard uh, Brother Curry Blake say, never ask God how much you should give. Because he doesn't think like you do. He'll tell you to give it all. <laughs> Why would he not? He, he sees no limitation. He sees 40,000 in your bank account. Great, start with that. Just... 
And the, and the number of people I've met who have multiple times in their life given everything away and received it all back, it's, it, it stirs my heart to think, what, what if there really are no limits to this gospel? What if we really can lay down our lives? And again, and that's when you hear all the needs across the world in this neighborhood, in your you know, neighbor's lives, your, your work. You know, Jesus is the one that's doing the heavy lifting. The burden on us is really light. We're just a vessel. We're just, we're just the ones that say, hey, you know what? I know the needs are endless, but um, I know someone. I know someone. And he's good and he's faithful. And um, just to, to encourage all of you that there really are no limits. Um, the thing most people don't know about George Mueller is that in 1875, at the age of 70, is when he began his 17 missionary journeys. As if he hadn't done enough until that point. 17 missionary tours, 42 nations, 200,000 miles, 3 million people. In 1875, at the age of 70. I think he, he stopped at like 82 or something like that. I mean, there's no limits. If this, if this guy, this old guy, can, in 1875, like 200,000 miles today is still a lot. That was back then. I mean, he's going from England to New Zealand, India, China, Japan, America. I mean, it's incredible. And so just as, as we, we close today, um, I want to make this very, very practical. Okay, so we know that following Jesus is costly. We know that missions is costly, but we're all in this together and we serve a good, good king. And so first and foremost, Hebrews 12, 2, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus every single day. I mean, if you get nothing else from today, just look to Jesus. Just look to Jesus. And ways to uh, be missional, again, is look to Jesus. Know him. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. If, any of you, if you've never asked God how to be missional in your life, God, if, if you just say, God, I surrender today to your mission in my life, just do that. Simple step and just see what happens. Like Bob said, He'll open the doors. God is way more concerned about the plan for your life than you are. He's way more concerned about the unreached than I am. He, he's got it. Surrender to him, trust in him, and be active in it. You know, like even, even for me, I, I am a champion of missions. And being in the U.S. can just cause you to get a little sleepy. It's a little comfortable. So we've got to be active daily, weekly, monthly. You know, if you're, if you're not currently involved in any way in missions, I would challenge you. And even if you are already involved in missions, I would challenge you to pray and ask the Lord as a family, God, how are we going to be involved in, in, in missions? Whether it's adopting a nation to pray for, to give to, to supporting a missionary, to, I mean, whatever it is, be active. Don't be passive. If you, if you need practical ways to get involved in missions. Come ask me, come ask Pastor Bob, Pastor, like we, we, have, we have the people, the places, the needs, we know the needs. We can, I can tell you right now, here's where you can give, here's where you can go, here's where you can serve, here's how you can love. Um, and have faith. You know, my, my faith goal for next year, and it's, it's crazy for me, um, is to, through our family, be able to give $10,000 to missions. That's not possible. Like, that's just dumb. Like, I shouldn't even say that. That's, that's, there's just no way, you know? But then um, I want to test the limits of what God can do, you know? I mean, George Mueller had nothing. He had, he had nothing. There's no reason $15 million should have come to him. So I think, you know, maybe 10,000 is a little low. Maybe God's insulted by that. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, but have faith. Believe for bigger. Can we, can, also, can we just cap, can we get rid of the $100? Guys, he, I, I, asked, I asked Pastor Brandon a few months ago. I was like, Brandon, when was your first mission trip? He said about 20 years ago. 
I said, did people give to it? He's like, yep. I'm like, how much? Like on average. He's like $100. That was 20 years ago, guys. <laughs> like two, three, four, five hundred should be the new norm. I'm not sure. If you've got a dollar to give, if you've got a pay, like the Lord sees that. It's about the heart. It's not about the amount. I'm just saying. Like it's costly. You know, let's let it be costly. And let's, let's give in abundance. And give not of compulsion, but of a joyful heart because it's exciting. You know, I love texting. I text my friend yesterday. Hey, I got a trip coming up. Coming up. Can you, you know, help with the cost? And he's like, yeah, how about 200? And then five minutes later, never mind. I can move some things around and here's a thousand. I was like, he, cause he has fun with it. I know him. His heart is to, to meet the entire need. And that's, that's a privilege. It's an honor. There's no compulsion. There's no guilt. None of us come up here like give, you should, you're missing out if you don't, not just the money, your time. I mean, Jesus is just so good. So let's, let's stand. Um, man, the Holy Spirit is faithful. And I just, I want to pray for all of you because my, my heart has been so softened. Uh, I mean, if you talk to me, if you, if you talked to me in the secret place two years ago, you would have gotten a tongue lashing, man. Just, that was yuck. That was just yuck. You know, we're called to build each other up. And uh, I love all of you, and my heart is for you, and my heart is for the kingdom to go forward, because we're all on mission. We're all on mission. I don't know what that is for your life, uh, but we're all on mission everywhere. And so, Father, I just thank you for this body. I thank you for this church family. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you speak. Yeah. Holy Spirit, right now I ask that you would faithfully speak clearly to every person in this room. And if you haven't already, ask the Holy Spirit what his mission for you right now is. In your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your family, wherever you currently are. And then ask him in Holy Spirit, where, where can I get involved in the out, abroad, internationally, in the darkest places, in the neediest places? And watch what he does. Why can't the church in Roseville be an answer to the church in Afghanistan and the church in Haiti and the church in North Korea? Why, why not? It might just be because we're not asking. So Holy Spirit, we are open, all of us in this room, that today would be a shift in our hearts as we surrender, as we count the cost of following Jesus. And we say, we're all in. Jesus, do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. Do it, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen.